In last week's episode, Peter Wolfenden introduced us to the early pioneering television experiments of Australian radio amateurs from the 1930s to 1960s. Peter described how he accidentally entered the world of amateur television in the early 1970s, noting this was in the days when affordable domestic video camera and videotape recorders did not exist. In this week's episode, Peter explains the types and purpose of amateur television test patterns, the influence of overseas clubs such as the British Amateur Television Club, the impact of how to build articles for converters to receive signals in the ham band, and amateur television DX between VK3 and VK7. Hello, I'm Peter, and this is my story of my involvement in amateur television during the 1970s. Before colour. Test patterns became uh, necessary to, for people to give you decent reports. Um, it was very difficult, uh, in my case, to get much more than about 300 lines, but we did achieve it. This was a commercial card from English Electric. I was into photography at the time and made a number of cards for different uh, amateur stations around by just photographing the call signs on a piece of cardboard in the centre of the screen. This was my commonly used card, the first one. Uh, you can see there are a couple of different sizes, or about four different sizes of printing there. And uh, the I mentioned that there was a group of us, and this was the group, another amateur in Sunbury, um, and uh, a station in Essendon and Box Hill. And this was loosely referred to as the Sunbury Amateur TV Group. <clears throat> On the right-hand side of the picture, you can see Mark II version of the test card, and uh, I think I've got 250 lines and 150 lines marked there uh, on the sides of the, uh, the main caption. And again, even a greater range of, uh, of print sizes. So... Uh, what was happening was that we were getting a number of people coming on the air and in their excitement in uh, giving handing out a report, they, they would say, oh, I'm receiving a fantastic picture from you. And then you would say, well, can you read the line across the bottom of the screen? Oh, um, yeah, I can sort of see something there, but I can't quite make it out. So uh, the test pattern card became a good way of finding out just how how well a, a signal a station was receiving. And here's just another one, a bit of variety, because uh, as, when you're just transmitting captions most of the time, you need something else to look at. We used to run a, a technical um, link on two metres. That was a talkback link, 147.63, I think it was, if I remember correctly. Uh, and that was chosen simply because somebody had a crystal on that frequency, and we, um, or which would work on that frequency, and so uh, the four of us uh, set up two meter uh, Vintons and what have you on uh, uh, on um, two meters to talk back to each other. I joined the British Amateur Television Club, and uh, they had a lot of good information. They published a regular magazine, which was of great interest to the um, anybody interested in television. A5 magazine, the American magazine, became available to us here in small quantities. British Amateur TV Club was founded in 1949. A5 magazine started in 1967. And the BATC also published uh, things on artificial television. <laughs> Enough said. Um, one big step forward was the design and publication of this converter. Uh, it had a major effect on amateur television right across Australia. Published in Electronics Australia, uh, it was a simple design which anybody could build. And it worked. It worked really well. Uh, the only change I ever made to it was to put an extra low noise preamplifier on the front of it at one stage when I was trying to uh, receive one or two other stations but most of the time I would just simply use that converter as it stood and feed it of course into a, a normal conventional television set on one of the vacant channels. We made a visit to Channel 9's transmitter up on Mount Dandenong and uh, um, this was given to me 
by one of the uh, the operators up there. Uh, it's interesting to know in the very early stages, all of the television advertising done when the test patterns were running, and some of you may remember that, all of that emanated from the transmitter. The clock, the lot, was all up there. Um, and... Uh, of course, there was a link down to the studios, but I would imagine that the studios would have been flat out during the day organising material for the evening uh, transmissions or the afternoon and evening transmissions. Don't forget, pretty much everything was live then except for a film, no videotape. And the British Amateur TV Club also brought out a test pattern, which was very good and used by a lot of us. This was perhaps one of the better things that they did, um, was a BATC television reporting chart. The only problem was with this, that you had to have the chart at the receiving end. So again, there was a degree of confusion as to whether something was acceptable or fairly good or passable. <laughs> anyway, it did help. VK3YGB uh, was a friend of mine uh, within the uh, the amateur TV group in Sunbury. He, in fact, was located in, e in Essendon, down in a hole in the ground. Uh, we did not have a direct path, uh, but we managed to get pictures through. Here's an interesting uh, image from VK3YAZ. Uh, you can see a wavy line there on the picture below. That's the Yarra River around Warrandyte. He was up in an aircraft um, transmitting pictures. Unfortunately here at Sunbury uh, the images weren't terribly strong. On the other side of Melbourne, um, uh, closer to the aircraft, uh, apparently uh, most people received almost noise-free pictures but uh, we were just a bit off the, uh, the beam. I think the aircraft might have been flying in the wrong direction for us. Another friend from Digger's Rest was John, VK3YJB. He um, was actually located at the Army Transmitting Station at Digger's Rest and uh, got very good signals through to this location. You can see the old Atlas television set I used as a monitor. I, I reduced the scanning a bit so you could see the full image size in the, uh, in the screen. And here's a very early picture, probably the first day that Peter put a transmission up, or the first time I received him anyway. Um, Peter was the other side of Melbourne, so we were beaming directly across Melbourne, probably in the order of maybe 50 or 60 kilometres apart. Les Jenkins, 3ZBJ, uh, at Frankston, one of his early transmissions. At the bottom right hand corner we can see a live broadcast retransmitted by Don 3YV from Forest Hill, also across Melbourne from me. Don was a technician at Channel 7 and this was a retransmission I would think of the ABC, dare I say, um, of their New Year's Eve concert. Uh, Don would run a few minutes of this uh, each New Year's Eve. And you can see, complete with sound, <laughs> uh, you can see it was a magnificent image. Now we move on to some of the interesting DX. This was the first image I received from Winston 7 Echo Mike uh, from Tasmania, from Penguin, in 1972. And this was the picture which he received from me. Again, uh, noisy pictures, uh, but they were there and uh, it was great excitement. In December 1973, we replicated the, uh, the two-way exchange from December 72. Uh, but again, pictures fairly, fairly average. In next week's episode, Peter Wolfenden concludes his early amateur television adventures, 
Peter will describe how the growing band of ham operators spread the word about amateur television in the mid 1970s via televised lectures and on location live broadcasts. Next week's episode includes actual 16 mm footage of transmissions, photos of actual equipment used, and details of award winning amateur television DX contacts. Remember, these episodes will be available on Ian's YouTube. Just search for Ian VK3QL. You are also invited to subscribe to Ian's YouTube channel so you don't miss out on more exciting programs about local amateur television.